Hello everyone and welcome to CRAMSurge, clinical research appraisal and methodology for surgical trainees, where we pick a paper fresh from the press on a hot general surgical topic. We review it for you, we present it for you, we critique its methodology for you and provide top of the field expert opinion and teaching on research appraisal and methodology. My name is Gio Perin and together with Professor Sababala Subramanian and Maria Digby, we bring you Kramsurge from the wonderful region of the Yorkshire and the Humber. Welcome back everyone. Today we will have a look at a paper that is slightly different from our sort of average choice. Um, the title is Evaluation of Transoral Endoscopic Thyroidectomy Vestibular Approach According to the Ideal Framework which was recently published in the BJS, uh, just in April 2022. Uh, we have the pleasure of having Mr. Nagala, one of the authors of this paper, uh, on our session. So we will have a very fruitful discussion session. I'll leave you to it. So the paper we're discussing today is the evolution of transoral endoscopic thyroidectomy vestibular approach according to the ideal framework. Um, it's essentially a literature review discussing the development of this new minimally invasive technique, thyroidectomies. Um, it was published in BJS uh, just last month, so it's a very recent paper. Um, and Gio is going to talk us through the aims of the paper. Yeah, so... Um... Very simply, the aim of this paper is to explore how the transoral endoscopic thyroidectomy via vestibular approach um, has developed itself through time as a new surgical technique and how the evolution of such technique fits with the ideal framework, which is a standardized way of interpreting and, 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 and sort of exploring the development of new surgical techniques uh, out there uh, across a variety of specialties. Um, so a uh, ball to you again, Riem. Yep. So this is just the picture to kind of visualize what we exactly mean by endoscopic thyroidectomy. So if you look at this picture, that's where the incisions are made um, to pass a scope and two working ports into a plane between the platysma muscle and strap muscles. Um, and then they insufflate the space with CO2 to create a working space to visualize the thyroid and um, take it out. And um, Gio's going to tell us a bit about the methods of the paper. Yeah, so um, as mentioned earlier on by uh, Riem, uh, this is uh, essentially a literature review, uh, which is focused on one platform, PubMed. Um, we don't really have much more than that in terms of search strings um, to comment on, but uh, um, obviously uh, this is the most uh, popular um, research data set out there, so uh, it's definitely a good choice. And the available evidence collected through uh, the literature search uh, was then organized and reviewed according to the different stages of the ideal framework, which we are going to briefly, very briefly, talk about as we go along with the presentation. Uh, is that right, Riem? Yeah, so the ideal framework consists of four, but really five stages if we count stage zero. Um, and the article is subdivided into these stages. Um, so we've got the pre-ideal stage, idea development, exploration, assessment, and long-term studies. Um, and we'll briefly talk about what each of them entails in the following slides. So Jill, will start us off with the first one. Of course. Uh, so we start with stage zero. Oh or pre-ideal or um, preclinical phase, where, whereby basically um, experts around the world um, start thinking about a new technique uh, and they start experimenting with it in uh, a preclinical stage, uh, either in cadavers or in animals. And specifically in relationship to this technique that we are discussing, um, the authors identified four uh, relevant, uh, five relevant papers. And um, as you can see, experimentation was originally conducted in cadavers and live pigs with a variety of different approaches. Now, the important thing to remember about this stage of the, of the sort of ideal framework is that at this stage, we don't have a, a single or a one uh, gold standard technique, um, but rather a variety of techniques that are experimented with out there, and they are generally refined in the following stages. 
uh, we then move on um, from stage zero to stage uh, one. Yep. So the first stage one, the idea is the first um, in human studies, as they mentioned. So the first case series that was published was by Willem and Metzig, and they used this combined sublingual and oral um, vestibular approach. Um, they had eight patients and reported quite a significant number of post-operative complications. Um, not long after that, the Nakajo et al. were the first to use a gasless approach in eight patients. Um, they only reported one case of recurrent laryngeal nerve palsy, but in a series of only eight patients, you could say that is quite significant. Um, Wang et al. were probably the most successful. Um, they renamed the trivestibular approach to ATOVA. Um, they had a case series of 12 patients and only reported two cases of transient um, skin ecchymosis. So they did quite well. Um, and then we move on to stage two. Yeah, so stage two, uh, as you can probably remember from uh, our uh, previous slides, is subdivided into two parts, stage 2A and 2B. Uh, 2A is the development stage, whereby um, the scientists around the world goes on assessing the feasibility of this new surgical technique in small groups of uh, patients in single institution. Generally, this is um, coming from uh, high-end uh, tertiary centers with high volume uh, surgeons uh, that are very familiar with the uh, uh, standard techniques adopted to perform a particular procedure and they start introducing new approaches. Um, and as you can see, there's uh, uh, kind of two papers uh, included or, or classified as belonging to this particular stage. Um, and here is where uh, Toetva really starts making a significant appearance uh, as a sort of standardized, uh, more standardized technique. Um, and as you can see, um, uh, this is from a group from Bangkok. Um, 60 patients are included in this uh, cohort study. Uh, and as you can see on the right hand column, results uh, are generally pretty good. Uh, two cases of transient hoarseness and one post op hematoma in a series of 60 patients. Um, I'd say is a, a pretty good result. Uh, bear in mind that, again, as I mentioned earlier on, these are very high volume surgeons. Um, at this stage, uh, the authors note how the sublingual approach really disappears from the um, sort of uh, available literature. Uh, and, this, you know, um, a couple of, of case series that talk about a combined oral and and sublingual approach. However, the number of post-op complications was such that uh, this technique is not kind of carried forward much. Um, so ball back to Uriam for stage 2B. Yeah, so in this stage, the main aim um, is kind of to collect information on this new technique to it, but through multi-center cohort studies with the goal to eventually progress to randomized control trials um, to compare this new technique against the current standards. And this stage also explores training options for surgeons. So in this stage, we get the first case series reported outside of Asia. Um, and it is only a small number of patients, just five patients, but it's significant because it shows us that this technique is feasible in a Western population who in general have a higher BMI than um, the Asian population. Um, and the group from Bangkok led by Anu Wong also conduct the first large cohort study um, consisting of 200 patients and they report low complication rates. Um, they also describe the first indications and contraindications for Tuetva, which um, we've got on the next slide. And this is when several countries around the world um, start publishing their experiences with Tuetva as well. Um, so it's kind of um, gaining recognition worldwide at this stage. Um, but there's no agreed training curriculum or training program at at present. They have, however, laid out some requirements for surgeons performing this technique, such as that they must be um, high volume thyroid surgeons who are familiar with um, laparoscopic work. Um, so we also get the first um, 
large retrospective cohort study in this stage. Um, the same group from Bangkok compare 425 uh, patients who underwent Tuetva versus 216 patients undergoing open thyroidectomy. And they found that although um, the Tuetva technique had longer operating times, the complication rates were comparable. Um, and obviously, the main advantage of Tuetva is the fact that patients are left um, without a visible scar. Um, and we've got the inclusion and exclusion criteria in this table, just for your interest. Um, and Gio will talk us through the remaining stages. Yeah, just a, a brief mention about stage three and stage four. Uh, I'm afraid uh, beyond stage uh, 2B, uh, there is not too much to say because um, stage three uh, basically is about comparing this new technique that at this stage is reasonably well developed uh, against the gold standard through a series of randomized uh, control trials. Uh, at this stage, no RCT have been conducted about um, TOETVA. Uh, so TOETVA uh, remains in stage 2B in terms of overall development. Um, we do know from the literature out there that open thyroidectomy has a low complication rate. And the authors do make an argument that uh, despite that, uh, it would be unethical to randomize patients that are wishing to avoid a scar, which is the main advantage of minimally invasive um, thyroidectomy, uh, to an open thyroidectomy in a, a randomized controlled trial. Uh, therefore, TRETVA should be compared with other minimally invasive uh, thyroidectomies. And we'll elaborate on this later on, um, particularly the authors talk about uh, the potential designs of, of an RCT. Um, and if there's nothing to say about stage three, probably there's not much to say about stage four either, uh, as currently it's impossible to uh, identify any study on long-term outcomes for this particular surgical innovation. So, um, Ball, back to you, Riem, to talk about the limitations. Yeah, so the authors have reported one limitation in their review, um, which is that their review was subject to the um, author's own interpretation of how the evolution of Tuetva has aligned within the ideal framework. Um, we've found a few other limitations as well, which Jill will talk us through. Yeah, I mean, a few a few more points that we thought about as we, we were reading this paper. Now, um, I think uh, I think at least me and Riem agreed that this is a review paper. Um, where does it fit in the spectrum of review papers? Uh, I am not entirely sure. Um, it could be either a, a critical review um, or it, it could be um, um, a discursive um, review, um, which aims to provide expert opinion on a particular topic. Uh, there's a variety of other reviews out there. Uh, it's about 14, 15 different types described. Um, I, I did struggle to fit it into a particular type. Uh, and uh, one of the reasons why I did struggle uh, is because inclusion and exclusion criteria for papers included in this review are not clearly laid out. And I suspect there's uh, Two reasons. One is that the main aim of the paper is to look at how a particular innovation fits with a particular framework. And the other one is probably that uh, uh, there's, there's probably some editorial reasons around it. Um, and this leads us to our third point, um, what, what search strategy was actually employed in, in PubMed and why PubMed was chose, chosen as a standalone uh, data set. Um, and finally, this is a minor a minor comment really more than a, um, a limitation. Uh, the authors make a very good point about um, for future um, studies, comparing this minimally invasive technique versus other minimally invasive um, thyroidectomies. Uh, and I completely agree with the point about it being unethical to randomize patients that wish to avoid a scar to a procedure that does involve an X-scar. However, on the other hand, I feel that there is not enough out there to definitely say that we are dealing with equivalent safety between toetva and an open thyroidectomy. Uh, 
and or comparable oncological outcomes, particularly if you're talking about obviously indications um, such as small um, cancers. Um, therefore, I do feel that perhaps there is a scope in comparing TOETFA with an open standard operation. And I'm saying this not being a thyroid surgeon. So there's possibly a point there that I'm missing. Uh, and I'd be glad to hear um, thyroid surgeon's opinions on this. Um, mostly because I, I'm, I'm more worried and I'm talking about uh, procedures that concern most of my area of, of expertise, if you like. Um, oncological outcomes and safety in terms of complications. Um, so, Ball, back to you, Riem, for some uh, uh, conclusions. Yep. So, um, conclusion to it was a, a new surgical approach to thyroidectomies with the main advantage that it doesn't leave any scars um, and its complication rates are comparable to open thyroidectomies. Um, however, at the moment, we don't have any randomized controlled trials to compare this technique against the established standard. Um, which is open thyroidectomies, because as we've mentioned a few times previously, it would be unethical to conduct one um, and randomize patients wishing to avoid a scar to open thyroidectomy. So at the moment, this technique um, remains in stage 2B according to the ideal framework, um, and it's difficult to see how it would progress from there really. Um, so that's the end of our presentation. A brief summary of the discussion we've had after the paper presentation. Uh, first of all, we discussed about the nature of this particular review. And uh, I guess some of the points that we make during the presentation itself, such as defining a research strategy, highlighting the issue of replicability of these secondary research findings, do stand when we see this as a, a review. However, uh, overall this could be interpreted as a, an opinion piece, an expert opinion piece. Therefore, in this context, identifying a rigorous research strategy and look for replicability is probably not as relevant. Uh, furthermore, uh, we discussed the issue of a randomized controlled trial being ethical in the context of minimally invasive thyroidectomy versus open thyroidectomy. Overall, uh, our feeling was that perhaps this is not much an issue of being ethical as such, as first and foremost, uh, it is important to compare a new technique with the gold standard in terms of safety and also oncological outcomes. Um, the issue that might arise is about feasibility, whereby patients knowing that they can have a scarless operation would then decide not to take part in a randomized control trial where they could potentially have a scar and this could impair the feasibility of a randomized control trial comparing to ETFA versus open thyroidectomy. Uh, we finally touched base on the need for this particular type of innovation, um, minimally invasive thyroidectomy, uh, and discussed how um, perhaps, yes, at the moment the perceived benefit is having a scarless operation. However, innovation often can lead to unexpected advantages, such as using a magnified platform could potentially reduce the risk of recurrent radiangial nerve injury or hypoparathyroidism following a thyroidectomy. At this stage, it is impossible to say. I will leave you now to a Prof. Saba lecture, which will expand on some of the concepts that uh, we touched on during the presentation itself. Thank you. So uh, this is a, this paper was a really good um, uh, paper to discuss, and we thought we should talk about the ideal framework uh, alongside this paper. Uh, the ideal framework is something that is increasingly talked about in the surgical literature.
Um, so it'll be good for students interested in surgery and trainees to, to uh, know what this is all about. So essentially, this is a framework that describes the stages through which a surgical innovation goes through or should go through as part of the evolution of the treatment or the innovation from just an idea to its incorporation into clinical practice. So just like we uh, have seen in this paper and um, it has been described, there are five stages and the stages are the idea stage, the development stage, the exploration stage, the assessment stage, and the long-term study stage. Now, uh, there's a lot of detail on the ideal framework on the website run by the ideal collaboration. And there's the uh, URL for the website and you can get all sorts of detail about how this was developed um, on the website um, in the form of a number of papers. Now I'm gonna give a very brief introduction um, without going into too much detail. Now, before we talk of the, of the ideal framework, I thought we should um, clarify or explain what the issue is. What is the problem that led to this framework being developed? Now, surgical interventions, uh, I'm sure you'd agree, do need to be assessed just like any medicine or drug intervention in terms of are they effective? What are the risks? And do benefits outweigh the risks involved? Yeah. And if you have a new surgical uh, innovation or intervention, then you want to know whether that new intervention is better compared to the standard. And the word better is quite uh, complicated. Better in what way? Um, better for the patient in what particular aspect uh, is important to define. Often, the benefits are pretty obvious. The benefit to risk ratio is huge, and the intervention has a clear explanation of biological rationale. And this often has happened historically in surgical innovations, and that's why surgical innovations, you could argue, probably were not as comprehensively assessed as drugs, if you like. And some examples include overrunning a bleeding artery, this obvious benefit, and fixing a fracture, laparotomy for peritonitis, closing a DU perforation. So these are um, interventions that, that, where the benefit is so clear cut and so obvious that you're not really going to be doing a randomized controlled trial. There was, as uh, some people may know, a satirical article in the BMJ some years ago that talked about how to assess the effectiveness of using a parachute when you want to jump off from an aeroplane. So um, just to make the point that when the benefit is so obvious, uh, you know, what is the point of detailed assessments and uh, um, evaluations? However, there are many other surgical interventions that have a much more nuanced benefit, if at all there is benefit. And some examples from general surgical and literature, if you like, would be radiofrequency ablation of liver metastasis, robotic versus laparoscopic gastrectomy, or for that matter, transoral thyroid surgery versus open thyroid surgery um, would also be an intervention or a comparison where the benefits are not very clear. Now, if the benefits are not very clear, then obviously they need to be assessed. But historically, what's happened is many interventions have been int introduced into surgical practice by expert surgeons, uh, by leading surgeons of the day, um, who have trialed and errored uh, in uh, using these interventions, who reported in retrospective studies that in their hands from centers of excellence, the in interventions are great. And these interventions have found a way into routine surgical practice. Now, some of them, such as laparoscopic cholecystectomy, have been a success. They've not been really proven to be of, ben uh, of benefit compared to open cholecystectomy in a randomized controlled trial. But nowadays, the standard gallbladder operation is a laparoscopic operation. There are many examples, unfortunately, of not so su successful examples, like gastrojejunostomy that used to be done for benign or malignant um, gastric outlet obstruction. Uh, in many centers, in many series, it used to be done without vagotomy. And if you don't resect the vagus, at the time of a gastrojejunostomy, you end up with severe and, um, and uh, painful anastomotic ulcerations. Another not so successful example is jejunoileal bypass for obesity uh, that um, unfortunately caused cirrhosis in many patients and death. So, so that's why um, interventions need to be assessed. Now, I thought it'd be useful to 
pause for a moment and think about what drives innovation in surgery, what makes surgeons innovators. Now, the first um, obvious uh, reason or factor would be the, the desire to innovate and to improve your patient outcomes. Cynics would say it's surgical ego that partly drives innovation and maybe the reward uh, monetary or otherwise that also drives innovation. A lot of innovation, um, like we've discussed, can be driven by industry and some by patients. And also there, there is uh, the other group of stakeholders who are the healthcare providers, hospitals and trusts who can drive innovation because uh, they want to increase efficiency and reduce costs of care. Now, that is fine, you're driving innovation is good, but how do you assess the innovation? Um, and and uh, I'm sure uh, people will agree that the assessment of surgical innovation should be on par with medical innovation. In other words, drug development. Now you may know that drug development goes through a number of phases, phase one, two, three, and four, and um, it is quite stringent and rigorous. And same should be the case for surgical innovation, especially when the benefits are not very obvious. And this will then form the basis of evidence-based surgical practice, which is what we all aim to do. However, there are some problems. Um, assessment of surgical innovation is not straightforward. So let's just look at uh, some of the difficulties in assessing surgical interventions, uh, as opposed to um, assessing drug interventions. Now, let's just uh, think of an example and talk through the difficulties. Now, let's just consider the example of assessing laparoscopic right hemicolectomy for secret cancer. And uh, the research question is, is that better than open um, in terms of recurrence, reducing recurrence and improving survival? Okay, so let's assume that that is your question and the in uh, innovation is laparoscopic hemicolectomy. Now, the first thing you probably will realize, especially in comparison with drugs, is that these interventions are complex. Now, complex interventions are particularly difficult to assess. Um, but before we go any further, we need to understand what a complex intervention is. Now, as um, described by the Medical Research Council, a complex intervention includes more than one component. There is flexibility in delivery and adherence to the way the intervention is implemented. And there could be interactions between the various components of the intervention and between the components and the context. So what, this, uh, what do these all mean in the context of laparoscopic right hemicolectomy? Now there are various parts to a laparoscopic operation that are very distinct and different from an open operation. Laparoscopic operations can be done in many different ways. And even if you, find an optimum way and our surgeons to do it that way, there'll be a lot of variation and there will be very little adherence to the so-called optimum way. And also there's so many interactions going on between the laparoscopic performance of the operation and the environment, the anesthetic team, the scrub team, the availability of other equipment in, in the operating room and so on. There are also a large number of confounding variables. I mean, confounding variables would be there in drug trials as well, but this is much more a problem in surgical trials. There is the influence of preoperative management, postoperative care, intensive care, and so on and so forth. The other big problem, unlike drug trials, is the learning curve. The surgeons need to do uh, X number of procedures to become adept at it, and that can vary from one intervention to another. And that can have a huge impact in biasing the results of a trial, exploring the role of a new um, technology. The other problem is that there's ongoing innovation of the intervention. So you've got a laparoscopic intervention that you want to study in a trial, but you will find that surgeons, as they do more and more of that particular kind of operation, will get better and better at it because they'll find newer tips and techniques that improves their ability to do that particular operation laparoscopically. So that'll be a problem. And this then leads on to when would you do a comparative assessment of a new technology? Do you wait for a large group of surgeons to become really adept and masters at this new technology? Or do you do this assessment quite early on with only a few adopters? And there's a guy called Buxton who proposed a law, a bit paradoxical law, 
where he said, it's always too early to assess a technology until certainly it is too late. So these are all some of the difficulties in assessing surgical uh, technologies. Now the ideal framework hopes to address these challenges and it's partly based on uh, quite detailed guidance provided by the Medical Research Council on complex interventions. They published some initial guidance in 2000, revised it a couple of times, and there's a full paper in the BMJ, and the link is here if you want to look at this guidance on complex interventions. Now, this does not just include surgery. It is all sorts of non-pharmacological interventions like surgery, like physical therapy, um, interventions in uh, radiology and radiation oncology, and so on. Now, it's quite extensive guidance, but I'll just um, go through a few general principles. Now, the guidance emphasizes that you have to go through iterative phases, repeated phases of development and evaluation at each phase. They also emphasize that you use experimental designs wherever possible and not rely on retrospective case series. The guidance emphasizes that you measure not only outcomes, but also processes and processes by which you went through the development of a technique. And, and they advise that you describe the interventions and components in detail, the components of the technology and the intervention, so that others can reproduce um, uh, uh, your intervention. It also enables synthesis of the evidence and implementing the intervention in practice if you've described them in quite a lot of detail. Right, so back to the ideal framework. I'll go through a few slides um, describing the various stages. The first is a preclinical stage. Uh, it was um, called stage zero in one of the earlier versions of the ideal framework. And basically it addresses the question, can the idea work, does the idea work before you've tried it in humans? So it is aimed to demonstrate proof of concept and safety prior to human experimentation. And the studies typically involve animals or simulators or models or a virtual or augmented reality. So you want to develop the technique as far as possible prior to your first in human studies. And safety is a major issue that needs to be explored. Okay, the second um, stage, or actually stage one, is the idea stage, which just then progresses the idea onto humans. Again, to demonstrate proof of concept and safety, and they're typically referred to as first in human studies. And they're usually single case reports or sometimes case series. And, uh, and they're quite selective, um, usually very selective, and uh, they're done by a very small group of surgeons, sometimes just one surgeon. And a careful assessment should be made of all of the potential risks and benefits before going on to the next stage. The next stage, 2A, is a development stage which addresses the question, has the intervention developed to a stage of reproducibility? Can lots of other people um, use the intervention and do it in a similar manner? And in this stage, the technique is optimized and the efficacy of the technique um, uh, is improved or you make attempts to improve the efficacy. And essentially this involves larger series of patients. And again, usually single arm studies in just a few centers or a few hands. And uh, traditionally, there are a number of innovations that have gone through this stage historically, but they have generally been retrospective. And the ideal framework discourages this. They advise prospective well-planned studies. Ideally, they need to be registered um, and, and um, done with appropriate informed consent and ethics approval. The next stage to be is the exploration stage where once you've developed the technique, you want to see whether it is ready to be tested in, a, in an RCT. So this is a pre-RCT phase. And the um, stage aims to explore utility in different cohorts of patients, different groups of patients, different indications, and um, should demonstrate reproducibility and improve efficiency. So those would be the uh, general aims of this stage. The kinds of studies that uh, are usually involved are multicenter studies, occasionally comparative studies or um, explanatory RCTs or mechanistic RCTs, where you're focusing um, particularly on um, can the technique work? 
and and, and then you do a comparative um, randomized control trial. Um, so you don't have to do a comparative randomized control trial. You could do a single arm study, but again, the framework encourages prospective studies as opposed to retrospective single arm studies. The next is stage three or the assessment stage. And this is a stage where you really want to know if the intervention is better than current practice, if the technology is better than current practice. So you've got to compare the intervention against current treatments, usually in a multi-centered randomized controlled trial. Now, occasionally, like I mentioned before, randomized controlled trials are not needed when the benefits are huge and obvious, such as in heart transplantation or liver transplantation. And occasionally, RCGs are just not feasible. And in this scenario, there are some alternative study designs that have been proposed by the ideal framework. One example is the parallel non-randomized studies. Now, one of the things you've got to keep in mind is that if the technology is, it has been adopted in many, many centers in, let's say, for example, in the UK, and surgeons are getting used to the technique and technology and like it and think that it is um, it provides it improves patient outcomes it might be difficult to then conduct an rct it might be that the it's a bit too late to conduct a, a randomized controlled trial just like what happened with laparoscopic cholecystectomy the final stage a stage four long-term study uh, where you want to ensure that rare outcomes or outcomes that present much later are, uh, are measured and evaluated. And also you're able to evaluate trends or changes in the indications for that uh, technology um, and changes in how the technology is actually delivered over time. So for this, you would do longitudinal observational studies and um, the framework encourages the establishment of registries registries that are either disease-based or procedure-based, and they encourage people to uh, take part in the registry and put the data in the registry so that the technology can be evaluated in the long term. Okay, so in general, there are a few things to keep in mind when, when, you, um, when you talk about the ideal framework. The first thing uh, is that the framework emphasizes that your innovation should go hand in hand with your assessment. And this should be in a continuous iterative manner right from the idea stage through to the implementation stage. Yeah, so that's fairly uh, um, obvious. The other thing they encourage is that um, as much as possible, the studies should be prospective, they should be planned really well, and the protocols should be published. And in addition to measuring outcomes that include the technical aspects of the innovation, Clinical benefits and harm should be assessed right from early on, right from your stage one, possibly even stage zero, you should be looking for safety and clinical benefits. They also en en encourage comprehensive reporting and publication at every stage um, of your uh, development. Now, if you uh, are trying out a technology and, you, and it doesn't really work, and you write a paper that says that the technology doesn't work, that's gonna be very difficult to publish. And for this reason, uh, the framework encourages societies and journals to establish registries and for people to be able to put their work in and for people's negative results to be acknowledged uh, so that others don't repeat the same work. Now, I've got this chart. I won't go into uh, this chart in too much detail, but this is from the ideal website. And if you have a technology um, and a report or reports and you wanna see what stage that particular technology is at, then you can just go through uh, the, this flow chart and then um, figure out at what stage your technology is at and how to take it further. So uh, you just go through the questions on this flow chart and then you figure out whether you are in a preclinical stage zero or whether it's a first in human study, which will be stage one, or whether it's at the development stage or an exploratory stage and so on and so forth. Okay, limitations. So one of the things I had a problem with uh, reading through the ideal framework papers is figuring out what exactly an innovation is. 
Any little improvement in the way you do a particular operation, is that innovation? Uh, so it becomes a bit difficult to, to clearly define innovation and the scope of uh, the, this issue. Because if you do a particular procedure many times over months to years, you will gradually often make changes. And you will improvise. You will use your creativity to improve patient outcomes in a number of different ways. And in some instances, after about 10 years, you will be doing the procedure in an entirely different way, potentially. So these changes are slow, gradual, and they naturally occur. And then uh, you're not really sure whether you call it innovation. And when do you say enough changes happen to call it an innovation? And along these lines, people have recognized that uh, sometimes innovation happens but it's not recognized as an innovation and you often recognize it quite late on and it may be in stage um, 2b or 3 and you may not have done the uh, earlier aspects of the development according to the guidance provided in the ideal framework some people think this this framework is not necessarily new many innovations have been through the stages that have been described however I would also say that many uh, innovations in surgery have fallen by the wayside after having been uh, used in hundreds of thousands of patients and then shown to be ineffective or harmful. And potentially, if those innovations have been, uh, had been adopted using the ideal framework, then the harm associated with those interventions could po possibly have been avoided. The other uh, final issue I have with the ideal framework is that uh, there's very little focus on the problem that the innovation is aiming to address. So what is the burden of disease that the innovation is addressing and how significant should that be and how should that be quantified prior to the innovation going to the stages hasn't really been uh, addressed. Okay, so uh, in conclusion, um, it's a useful set of guidelines on processes to adopt when you are considering a new intervention, when you're exploring a technology. Just to recap, IDEA stands for idea, development, exploration, assessment, and long-term study. There is a preclinical stage, um, which is essentially um, uh, stage zero. There are some modifications to the ideal framework because um, if you think about complex interventions, it's so vast and there are so, so many different types that some groups have uh, come forward and proposed their own modifications of the ideal framework. So there's an ideal device. That's a modification of the ideal framework just for devices. There is an R ideal, which is used apparently by radiation oncology researchers for their particular speciality. There's an ideal physio, um, which is apparently useful for physical um, therapy interventions and so on. And I'm sure there'll be many more to come. The key is that IDEAL is increasingly recognized and accepted by many, many national and international organizations and regulatory bodies. So as surgeons, surgical trainees, and students interested in surgery, it's important to understand what this is all about. There's uh, updates available at the website. I'm sure there'll be many more updates to come. Uh, and uh, uh, this, is, um, this link uh, is probably the best way to uh, keep yourself abreast of what's happening or when you're considering a technology, uh, make sure you look up the ideal website and go through the updates. Thank you very much. Thank you everyone for tuning in and listening. Until next time, keep running your life with our surgical podcast.